Alright guys, welcome to the first ever Real Podcast Hours. Uh, the whole idea behind this podcast is that we'll be talking about a different topic each time and uh, saying our opinion. Uh, we'll be using sources to back up what we say. Uh, if you want to check out our sources, there'll be a link down in the description below. Alright, let's get into who we have on the podcast this week, starting with Stefan. Hey, what's up? Uh, I go to school in San Diego. Yeah. That's my fun fact. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Daniel. Hey, this is me. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, next up, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, next up, we have Charles. Hello, I go to school with this dude. All right. Uh, Yay. We have uh, Nick next. I'm Nick. I go to FLC and I'm very loud. <laughs> Yeah, he, he is very loud. Finally, um, oh, 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 Daniel's retarded as well. Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> we agreed not to use me. I didn't sign it. It happens. It happens. <laughs> I didn't sign it. All right. All right. Okay. Finally, my name's Matt. Uh, I'm kind of like the cat herder right now, so I'll be like trying to wrangle these idiots around, but no promises. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let's <laughs> let's let's jump into this topic this week. Um, AMD Ryzen versus Intel Core. We'll be going over each of the processors, uh, kind of like what they do, how they compare to each other in multiple different facets, such as gaming, uh, workstations, anything like that. All right. Um, so let's Ooh. start with let's start <sighs> with like general features. So I'm talking like things that are support like these processors support, <clears throat> such as like. RAM speeds, PCIe lanes, that kind of stuff. Let's just get that right out of the way real quick. So, uh, Dan, do you want to talk about what Ryzen is? I guess Ryzen is kind of AMD's jump back into the CPU market. They were pretty idle for a while, uh, staying on their previous uh, architecture. They weren't really competitive in the market, but with Ryzen, they're kind of getting back in the game. Uh, I guess I will do kind of like the uh, intro for Intel. So basically, Intel Core is Intel's like consumer level processor. Uh, they started in two thousand, the early two thousands, with like the Core Two and the Core Two Duo and the Core Two Quad, which are different. But the actual like Intel cores, like the i three, i five, i seven, which you see around today, they started in like two thousand ten ish. Uh, and they've been, you know, releasing them yearly with, you know, uh, s decreasing the size, increasing speeds, that kind of stuff yearly. Yeah, that's basically what Core is. Let's talk about overclocking then real quick. Uh, Dan, do you have any experience with overclocking Ryzen? Um, overclocking Ryzen, not really a whole lot. I've just kind of messed around with it a little bit on my brother's computer and just kind of reverted back to stock. Mm -hmm. um, I did overclock my old CPU, which was... I believe on the pile driver architecture, uh, it overclocked pretty well. I was able to get like an extra gigahertz out of it. Oh wow! But Ryzen, I'm not too familiar out of uh, too familiar with it. Okay. Uh, well, I think one of the advantages that Ryzen has is the fact that any of their CPUs are overclockable. I'm am I right about that? Yeah. So unlike Intel's, where you have <coughs> to have like a K series processor, or they recommend that you have a K series processor. Uh, all of a uh, all of AMD's Ryzen and before that they're unlocked so that as long as your uh, motherboard supports the overclocking, you can uh, overclock those CPUs. Now, yeah. uh, Nick, you have an AMD based <coughs> system. You have a Ryzen. Uh, yeah, I have a Ryzen five fourteen. Okay. Uh, is yours overclocked? Uh, no. Okay. Mainly because I do not know how to open. I also don't sure. entirely care enough to overclock it because what I notice, I don't need it to do a whole lot. It just does what I have it. Yeah. Yeah. Overclocking is one of those things where it's like just a, it's just a phrase that you go, "Ooh, I can overclock it." Where, um, <coughs> in my personal experience, I have a uh, i seven fifty seven hundred K, which came out in two thousand fifteen. Uh, I have mine overclocked from its boost core of 4.1 gigahertz to 4.7 gigahertz. Right now is what I have it overclocked to. Uh, and my synthetic benchmarking, it's running at basically what a stock 7700K is running at. Which, when you think about it, I mean, it's you cool. Basically bought a, you basically bought a lower end one and made it 
you know, like the more expensive yeah, ones. Yeah, I bought one that was a year older and cheaper <coughs> and then made it perform like a year newer. But then again, <coughs> there are new features that the 7700K has, and then its overclocking ability is even better. So it's like overclocking is one of those things where it sounds really cool, and if you can do it and get it done easily, you can get some benefits out of it. But it doesn't really replace just having a better CPU on hand, like a generation newer or like a higher level CPU. Indeed. Hey, uh, okay, Charles, uh, what, uh, what computer do you have? I use a Lenovo laptop. Okay. Do you have a desktop? No, I do not. Okay. Not anymore. Do you have any experience with, like, building computers or anything like that? No. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Yeah. Well, so, okay, so I think, uh, Charles here is going to be, like, the person who, like, you know, you, you don't have a ton of experience in it, so maybe as this podcast, like, goes on, you can, like, listen and kind of get an understanding, and then maybe by the end you can say which side sounds better based off of, like, what we've been able to tell you. Mm. I'm most likely going to be doing the same thing as him, because I don't know I don't know much of the technicals <laughs> of the, the, the different CPUs. I just, <coughs> you know, right. I look at I look at what once looks best, and, and that's what I got, so. Right. And I've been, you know, my family has been using Intel for, you know, ever since Intel was a thing, so, like... That's why I got an Intel i7, the same one as you, Matt, uh, for my computer when I was building it. And is yours overclocked? It is not. It sits around 4.1 right now gigahertz. Um, I've tried overclocking it, but I'm not as good as other people are at overclocking in my BIOS. I think I've overclocked it at 13% and it crashed. So yeah, I need to I need to just go back in and start working on it. Right now it's over. Technically it's overclocked at 7%. But um, that's not anything right now. Like it's barely a, an improvement. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it improves it by like 0.1 gigahertz, barely. Like, you you can actually get a little bit. Like that can the difference in like a 0.1 gigahertz overclock can mean um, more stability in a game frame rate wise, or more stability in a game from crashing or stutters or stuff like that when your CPU has a slight, even a slight overclock on it. Yeah. I mean. Whatever I have on it right now works with any any game that I own. I can run at either above or just about 60 frames. Um, there's only a couple games that I think go below, and I think like one of them is No Man's Sky. And I, um, I, I think it runs around 50 or 55. But yeah, and I th you have a 970, correct? GTX 970. Yes, I have a GTX 970. Okay, and from what I under, I think with most games, then you're not CPU bound. You're um, your GPU bound for frame rate as you start to crank your settings. Yeah. Because the 6700K for a long time was um, paired with the GTX 1080 and GTX 1080 Ti, which were regularly getting medium high, maybe into the ultra settings for 4K and getting 60 frames a second without bottlenecking the ability of the GPU, which is something we'll yeah. get into more when we talk about gaming in general. Uh, so I think you're more GPU bound in that case. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about uh, core count and thread count. Um, so Stefan and I, both of our desktops being the same processor, we have what are, we have four cores and eight threads. Um, basically, uh, our processors have hyper threading in them, which me, which is basically like a uh, code execution which allows a single CPU core to bounce between two processes really quickly and act like two physical cores. It's like one core can normally only do one process at a time per clock, which is the uh, transistors flipping. Uh, but with hyper-threading, what this is allows it to do is basically like how you multi like humans multitask, where they can switch back and forth between multiple tasks really quickly. Uh, that's what hyper threading does. Uh, Daniel, what uh, what CPU are you currently running? So right now I have an Intel i5 uh, 4690K. So it's a non hyper threaded i5, and right now it's running at 4.6 gigahertz stable. Okay, and uh, yours is <clears throat> definitely overclocked. Yeah, it's overclocked quite a bit. Because I'm pretty sure the turbo speed for the 4690K is. 3.6 gigahertz, right? 
I think it's around 3.7, something like that, okay, yeah. So you have almost a gigahertz overclock, which is pretty incredible. That's pretty good. He's got over what I run, and he has the gen lower than mine. Yeah. Than both, than both of ours, yeah. He's got a couple generations older, and he's also got a, re a much bigger um, process, which is something we'll talk about, like a die process. Um, yeah. So let's talk about how AMD and Intel have differed between how they handle core counts. Um, Daniel, again, do you want to talk about how AMD handles cores, or is there anybody else who knows how AMD has typically handled cores and wants to really talk about um, it? If I remember right, it, was, it wasn't it was quite hyper-threading. I don't remember exactly what they did, but a lot of their cores, they would advertise them as like six-core CPUs, but they would... Uh, actually have three cores and they would split them into six and it was just kind of an odd way about going things right um yeah. so like basically if i understand this correctly amd the way that amd does it is that typically in the past instead of having a, a single really powerful core that can do uh, a lot of instructions per cycle which is basically like an instruction per cycle is how many instructions can it do per like flip of a transistor basically yeah uh, amd's method instead of creating a powerful like single core they would throw more cores at it so that it could kind of make up for the fact that each core wasn't all didn't have all that great of an instruction per cycle but they had more cores so any program that could utilize those more cores would would have less be at less of a disadvantage on an amd system yeah, okay. something like that would probably be better for like a, a workstation build or content creation or things like that. Right. But gaming, it's much better to use the uh, IPC route. Right, and that's what Intel has really done with their core series, especially with their, their second generation, which, which came out in 2000 and between 2012 and 2013, depending, because they kind of stage their releases of their processors. Well, both of the companies do. Uh, but... Mm -hmm. uh, the second generation of core, so like the second generation core i3, i5, i7 were uh, nicknamed Sandy Bridge architecture. I believe they were based on the 22 or 24 nanometer process. And what, what really happened here, if I can pull up one of my sources, is that this, what Intel did is that they made these super powerful cores. They were able to just absolutely obliterate what AMD could put out in like at least in benchmarking and definitely in gaming too. Um, yeah. You know, they had the this for example here I'm looking at the Intel 2700K which came out in Q3 of 2011. There it is. Um versus the AMD FX8350 which came out in Q4 2012. The 2700K is a four-core, eight-thread, which means it has four physical th cores with a hyper-threading, which will allow each core to act as two cores. And then yeah. the FX was an eight-core, eight-thread, so no hyper-threading, but twice as many physical cores. Um, even with this two, even with this year difference, the 2700K was 26 at least 26% faster stock speed and 40% faster when overclocking. Uh, and I'm using userbenchmark.com, which is basically like this benchmark website that anybody can use that they can benchmark their system. And then uh, for anything from RAM to your uh, GPU, you can see how it's comparing to other people running the same GPU. You can see how two different GPUs are comparing, not just based off of how one person got a... Um, a benchmark to run but based off of how you know in this case 11,000 people with a 2700k ran the benchmark and 222,000 people ran the <coughs> benchmark with the fx8350 the second generation starting in 2011 was definitely where intel figured out how to do these these cores that they could have a ton of instructions per cycle which allowed them to have less cores which means a lower um a lower TDP, which is um, you know, lower, they, so they required less power, um, 
which means they produced less heat and they were still just as powerful as or more powerful than a, the AMD equivalent with twice as many physical cores. Indeed. And that's kind of and that's kind of where AMD fell into their market because their CPUs despite being less powerful and more uh, heat producing and all that were much cheaper than the Intel uh, counterparts. Right. So this, uh, for example here, according to user benchmarks, the 2700K retailed for 290 while the <clears throat> FX8350 retailed for $130. Obviously yeah. now with how old they are, you could find them for, you know, you know 30 bucks or something They're like cheap. that. Yeah, I'm a dozen. Cheap. Yeah, that's where AMD really fell into the market for a long time, was they would nibble at the lower end, just because that's the only place where they could compete. Yeah. I mean, that's that's where I got started when I built my first computer. I had an FX6350, and uh, eventually that just kind of became not enough to run the games. So what my friend actually did, because he had just upgraded to an 8700K, was he gave me his old CPU, which was the this i5 that I'm using now, and it actually performed better despite having two less cores. Oh, so yours was a six core. Yes. Did it have any hyperthreading? Because I know. Uh, technically yes. AMD say like six cores, six threads, but what they actually did was they took three cores and kind of managed to make them, uh into six it was like hyper threading it wasn't quite hyper threading i don't exactly remember what they did and i can so, pull up that information so i think uh, i think what they did was they took like two cores and made them into like a bulldozer unit or whatever they called it based off of their architecture and mm. what they did is they had those two cores share their l1 l2 and l3 cache which is basically like the cache is what um is where the computer stores um, instructions before it actually executes them. And yeah. so what, that, what happens when you have a shared cache is that that limits the ability of your each core to store um, individual instructions. But yeah. So instead of doing the hyper-threading, they... Uh, they gave they had two physical cores instead of having one core act as two cores, but they had those two cores share caching and, and other things that I can't remember off the top of my head. So it, it hurt their ability to be like actual like independent cores. Mm. If that makes if that makes any sense for everybody else. It kinda, does. Kinda makes sense. Yeah. It's <clears throat> it's still I'm I'm still trying to like while you guys are talking, I'm reading up on like cores and threads because I'm still trying to wrap my head around how all that stuff works. Because I've, you know, I up until like a couple months ago, I didn't know that my CPU had threads, but that's just something that, you know, I'm not that well versed in uh, computer science, it, I guess you could say. Yeah, it it runs pretty. It's a pretty deep running like you can go from everything from just like okay, how does this perform and what it what's its price to I have found in my search for sources here uh, for this and previous writings to like uh, research papers that involve <coughs> the physics of moving electrons around and how they interact with transistors and like actual like we're getting down to how small things can get until electrons start jumping from transistor to transistor because of how close they are together. Which is a physical limit that we're going to be running into here soon with uh, processors. So you're going to have to find a way to stop the electrons from moving uh, from transistor to transistor, is what you're saying? Right. Like in the future, start developing higher powered processors. Right. So uh, I guess that, I guess this is a good thing to talk about. So basically, um, processors <clears throat> run on different die sizes basically what they how what companies do like intel and amd they take like a sheet or a film of um silicon and they, so basically the way that processors are currently getting more efficient is is that they are making these these die sizes where they're putting in these uh traces for transistors and they're also decreasing the size of transistors but they're making these die sizes smaller 
packing these transistors in closer to each other and making them smaller. And when you have a smaller transistor, that means less energy is wasted mechanically flipping that transistor open or closed. So more of it, more of that energy uh, is preserved, you know, when you move the transistors from open and closed, allowing them to use less energy. Basically, smaller is better. Smaller is better. The issue is, is that we're getting down to, to like seven nanometer, you know, mobile processors. Some of them, I think, are starting to get down into the five nanometer size. We're getting to the point where, because electrons behave like a wave and a particle, like they won't, we won't be able to like keep them to go through one transistor. They will go, they will go to the path of least resistance. And if that is a transistor mm. that's like right next door, they'll just jump transistors. Which means that that could that that would short the whole CPU, wouldn't it? It could short the CPU. It could also mean that it just straight up won't work. Yeah, because because the electrons aren't going making, where they're supposed to be. It makes data based off of that electricity either coming through that transistor or not coming through that transistor. And if that information that it's expecting to not go through that transistor comes through a different transistor, it it yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Especially when you're talking about billions of transistors. Eventually, we can't make these processors any smaller. So what we're going to have to do is make them more efficient based off of what we have now. And that's what Intel's been kind of doing with their 14 nanometer. And even now today, 2020, desktop processors from Intel are still going to be 14 nanometer. But what they've been doing is, is that they've been <coughs> pushing how many gigahertz they can get out of that 14 nanometer process. Or they're pushing... Um, how power efficient they can make it. They're pushing how many instructions per cycle they can get out of each of their processors on said die size, which is what the whole industry is going to end up doing here within the next couple of years, probably. Okay, so this is where we're going to get into where people are like actually like giving their opinion. Uh, mm. we we're going to have another person on, but I guess I guess they got busy with something, so they're they're unable to make it. Uh, but we're going to be talking about how how easy each of these architectures are to build a computer with. So we're going to be talking about how easy it is to build based off of an Intel system and how easy it is to build an AMD-based system using the Ryzen space. Which, Daniel, you have the most experience here with building AMD-based, or Nick, yours is... Yeah. Nick, did you build your desktop? Uh, I, I built it for him. I built it for him, Okay. Yeah. So, Dan, what is your... And you've built an Intel system, too, correct? Yeah, my own. Okay. So, what is... You've built on the AM3 socket for AMD? I It's the AM3 Plus socket, which is just a revised version of the AM3. That was what my uh, computer used to run off of. Okay. Um. Yeah. And then your... And then the AM4 is what this new Ryzen stuff is. I don't know if they've moved on to AM4 Plus or not. I don't but think, it's... think so, not yet. No, I don't I think, think so. They, from what I've heard, is, is that AMD wanted to make AM4 as forward compatible as po possible. Yeah. So they wanted to be able to make it so that you could have processors for years work on the same, same um, chipsets and sockets and stuff like that. Yeah. And then on the Intel side of things, um, the current Intel socket is LGA 1151, which I have pretty good experience with building on. And then Dan, the 4690K is LGA 1150 or 1155? Um, I thought it was 1155. I know we were talking about this yesterday. I don't quite remember which socket it was. It is. I know that the uh, the motherboard is on the Z97 architecture. I know that. So you've built with both the AM3 and the LGA 1150, which is basically the same mounting and stuff like that as the 1151. Which one mm -hmm. have you like? Which one did you think was easier to build? Um, honestly, probably the AMD one, just because maybe it's just because I had more experience with it, but. The way you install the CPU in an AMD system is on the motherboard, there will be a triangular notch cutout both on the uh, mounting piece on the motherboard, and there will be a golden triangle on the CPU, and you just align the two, 
you put it in, you jiggle it around a little bit just to make sure the CPU's all set in. And then all you need to do at that point is there will be a lever that's popped up at this point, and you just uh, push the lever down and latch it onto the side, and that'll lock the CPU in place. It's a fairly easy that's, process. That sounds fairly similar to what mine was, um, except instead of being a triangle, it was square. Um, yeah. Intel i7. Um, but yeah, it was just, for mine, you just uh, lift up a flap and drop it in there, and then close the flap and lock, lock the latch in place. And that was it. Yeah. Uh, I think the one big difference between the two, though, is that on Intel, on their CPU, they have what's called a land grid array, which is where they don't actually have pins on the CPU in order to make connection with the motherboard. They just have little uh, contact patches, and the pins are on the, the motherboard. The newer ones are reversed. Yeah, the newer the ones do, but I believe on... I, wait, maybe mine. I think mine did have the same. Yeah, yours bad. Has, I don't, ours I, has contact pads. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I thought I thought mine had pins. I because because when I when I put mine in, I put a little bit too much thermal paste on it, and I got a little bit of thermal paste on the contact uh, area, and so I had to clean it off. Surprisingly, it still works. But um, I thought I, I when I when I was looking at it, I thought I was it was pins, but it's not. Yeah, and I think the reason that Intel does it with the contact points is because. Um, one of the issues that you can run into when you you take a processor out or you are feeding a processor is if the pins are on the actual processor side, you can bend them easier. Yeah, yeah. it'd be very bad to bend a pin. I haven't had any issues. I've taken apart and refeeded mine in my current system multiple times and haven't had any issues with bending any of the pins, partially <laughs> because they're a part of the motherboard. And the motherboard is normally mounted, or it's either sitting on your desk or it's inside your case already. So it's like, it's like stable, it's sitting, it's fine. It's the CPU that's moving around. And the CPU being flat because it's just contact pads doesn't have anything to grab onto the pins with and then like bend them. Whereas if you had the pins on the, um, on the CPU side, you can get them caught on different things and bend them while you're trying to feed the processor correctly. Yes, you can, and I actually have some experience with that. I think it was when we had taken Nicholas's system apart at my house, uh, some way or another, the CPU pins actually got bent, some of them, on his processor. Yeah, and luckily, there was a thermal paste on them. Yeah, it was not looking too great. But luckily, uh, what we were able to do was I think we had taken a credit card. And straightened and, them out. Yeah, because the pins weren't bent all that much. So it was, was kind of like someone back. like brushed over them almost, so they kind of like, like not not exactly bended, but they kind of like folded almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't exactly. to the point where like they got um attached. Right. They still had connection. I mean, because at first I was like, oh man, I gotta get another. I mean, like the good thing was they're not too expensive, and but I was like, I didn't really want to have to buy another one, but it worked. It's still good right now, especially after I got the thermal paste off, fixed pins. Okay. And I mean, that's where Intel probably would have been better. Yeah. Uh, when building a system, it's just it's less risky. Yeah. That's true. So, uh, your forty six ninety K also has the contact pads. Yes. Okay. They've been using Land Grid Array for a while. Okay. So that might be that might be something interesting. So if you're looking to buy, uh, if you're looking to build a computer, and you you can't afford something that's like brand new, and you're looking to like say game on it. If you're looking at older processors, um, the older Intel processors hold up better for gaming because of the better IPCs that they have versus like the uh, bulldozer, pile driver, excavator based yeah. AMD processors. Um, and also, they for those who are like learning how to actually build a computer, it sounds like it's a little less risky to be a little more clumsy. You know, like learning how to feed a processor properly if you have the contact array. Yeah, I would I would definitely recommend if you're looking into buying older parts, just go with Intel, because they're they're cheaper nowadays and they're just safer to build and they'll perform better. It's just a no brainer. Right, and so that's that's older, but we're talking we're going to be talking about Ryzen, which is newer, starting in 2017, and that's where things get really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So if we talk about um, 
if we move into synthetic benchmarks, so like looking at like Cinebench, yes. stuff like that, there becomes a there becomes a clear pattern here between the new Intel processors and the new Ryzen processors, and that is if the um, if the benchmark likes lots of cores or is a multi-core based benchmark, AMD Ryzen kills it. Yeah. Because you have things like the AMD Threadripper or the second gen Threadripper. That's out now, right? Uh, yes, it is. They're working on the third one coming out sometime soon. Early 2020, I believe. Um, where you have 32 cores and 64 threads. It's insane. Which is just insane. And um, so anything that likes cores, when you're talking about things like SolidWorks or um, any rendering software, you know, if you're working oh. with stuff like oh, thank you. Adobe or you. like Adobe uh, Premiere or anything like that, if you have something with a lot of cores on it, it's going to per it's going to perform noticeably better on these higher core count AMD based systems. Yeah. Especially if you get the higher end AMD ones, because they have a lot of cores and they also have hyper threading. Yep. Basically, a lot of multi core stuff AMD is swamping Intel. Right. Um, but if we look at say single core scores, um, that's another place where AMD with the Ryzen and the Zen and the Zen two architecture has really like caught up a lot. Uh, you're looking at like say the um you know the 3700x versus the 9700k and they are like very close on that single core intel of course like edges is out edges it out a little bit and that's partially due to the fact that um that 14 nanometer process intel is super good at getting like at milking every last ounce of um performance out of that 14 nanometer process yeah um, so what does multi-core and single-core synthetic benchmark mean for anybody who's, like, just looking for a computer to use daily? So for, like, a like a daily computer, you mean, like, a like a workstation slash light gaming kind of thing, or? Well, I'm thinking somebody who goes, okay, I need to do homework online, you know, read emails, videos. Light gaming as in, like, you know, like, solitaire, that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, then, I guess for those kinds of computers, go as cheap as you can, because you really don't need a whole lot of power to do that. I mean, you might see some bench or uh, some benefits from uh, multi-core CPUs, because they're better ability to multitask. Right. Um, but, honestly, if you're really doing that kind of light computing. You don't need to worry too much about what your processor choice is as long as it's cheap. Right. And that is something that I believe... Yeah, here. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. So I wrote a research topic on this. And when comparing the i3-2120, um, so the second generation, like the second generation i7 we were talking about earlier, and we compare yeah. it to the modern i3 9100F. And the F means that it doesn't have integrated graphics on board. Um, which most, every Intel processor has, except for the models that say F at the end of their uh, little number string. And the 9100F is, on average, 97% faster than the 2100F. And the 9100F costs $85 to buy. So less than $100, and it is twice as fast as um, the 2120 from 2013. On the AMD side, uh, the FX4300 is 88% slower than the Ryzen 3 3200G, which... Ryzen is like the opposite of uh, Intel, where they don't have integrated graphics unless they get a specific number or specific letter at the end that says that that has graphics, and that's what the G represents. I'm pretty sure on the Ryzen side of things, it means that it has it has a uh, Radeon 
graphics as part of the DAI. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. they used to call them uh, APUs. I'm not sure if they do still. They might. But the APU, it was basically just a GPU die and a CPU die on the same thing. Right. So basically, what we're saying, and then these, uh, the the thirty two hundred G comes in at eighty six dollars, and it ranks ninety fifth out of every single CPU that's been tested on user benchmark. For eighty, for less than a hundred bucks, and it's eighty-eight percent faster than something from two thousand thirteen. So, I think the point of this is that you can get a super cheap uh, computer with like a super cheap processor in it, a Ryzen three or an i three, which are like the bottom of the core and the bottom of the Ryzen, mm -hmm. and they will be more than adequate to deal with these um, uh, daily tasks. Rip. Real quick, my brother, uh, I got me and my dad got him a laptop that has a Ryzen, and he he uses it for school, and so far, it's performed really well for just that. There you go. Do you know what's in it? Uh, Ryzen, Ryzen three. Um, hold on, I might actually have the computer box. Does anybody know what's in the uh like Surface? Oh, oh. It's like from like the Surface, the Surface Pro from like uh, I want to say twenty sixteen or twenty fifteen. Those are um, so. Um, the Surface based computers have been all uh all Intel based. I mean, you can yeah, I know they're I know they're Intel. I, you can get them with an i three and i five or an i seven depending on if you get a Surface, a Surface Pro, and which level of each you get. Like oh, most okay. laptops. Um, yeah. The new surfaces that just were announced, so like the Surface Laptop 3 and the Surface Book 3 and the Surface Pro 7, I think, they will have, for the first time, Ryzen options. Uh, I can't really? huh. find the box, which I don't exactly know what's in it. I just know it's an AMD laptop. Okay. but it, And it is like a it's, Ryzen? It's a Ryzen 3, and I just know that has an AMD GPU as well. Right. Okay. Yeah, what I was gonna say is that my my sister she has a Surface for three years of college and she still uses it, um, and it got her all the way through college working on it and it still hasn't died. It was it was the one with the Intel in it, but I don't know what processor it was because I don't know the specific one. Yeah. But um, it's like for just doing homework online, writing essays, and stuff like that, the normal stuff. For just like a college work laptop, that thing performed beautifully. It never ran slow. It never, you know, died on or anything like that. So yeah. Plus, it's just convenient. I mean, I really like the fact that you can take it and sand it up somewhere and type on it, and then flip it back over and use it as a tablet. And that's one of the cool things about the Surface is, is they have they use like good parts and they make them. Yeah. Their build finish and quality is really good. I mean, they're designed to be yeah. a Windows competitor to the MacBook, but be more interesting form factor wise. Mm hmm. Um, it's like they've got attachable, um, what are they? Alcantara keyboards, right? Yeah. Yeah. My, yeah. my dad. They're has, really nice. My dad. They're, they're just so satisfying to type on. Sorry, Matt. Yeah, they're awesome. That's all right. Um, my dad has a Surface Pro 4 with the like top tier i7 that came with that model. And. Even though it's a dual core with four threads, so like it's like a it's like a fifteen watt CPU. By comparison, like the six thousand seven hundred K is a ninety five watt CPU in the desktop, so like it's very low power. Um, he still runs games on it. Like he he plays uh, Diablo two on it just fine and stuff like that, which is an older game, but. Um, you know, it still does it well, and it's a super thin, small form factor. Yeah, it just it they they they're really sleek. They're very aesthetically pleasing, and they run very. Yeah, and I think the big jump for mobile, at least on the Intel side, was fifth generation and up, because I believe fifth generation was the introduction of the fourteen nanometer process. So that means that like you're getting, you're getting much smaller, much more efficient, yet still just as powerful CPUs that are more uh, battery friendly. And we've just been seeing these huge mobile game, mobile gains in terms of 
laptops and tablets, especially based on, you know, Windows and stuff like that, where they're getting yeah. more powerful with, like, almost no power gain in terms of their watts required to run. One thing, one thing that I'm surprised about is um, how well uh, people have been making advancements in the mobile, um, like, phone processors. Yeah. I mean, I know we're talking mainly on CPU, but just, like, or uh, not CPU, just mainly on, like, computer processors, but this one, like, just, the ones that they put in, like, say, the, the OnePlus 7T, um, I can't remember the exact one that, that that's in it, but I've heard that it, like, outperforms almost every single other processor in phones in such a small, you know, little area. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty crazy how they can, you know, jam-pack some kind of small processor and make it run that well well there's a whole hour-long discussion we can have on on mobile ones on i know mobile. yeah and they're they're super they're they're much different because um these types of uh like the one that you run windows on they're x86 based versus uh, mobile which are arm based which the way that they handle executing instructions and stuff like that they're very different so even if you're seeing like higher clock speeds and higher this and that, the 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 way that they execute stuff gives x86 based like an advantage because it can handle multiple processes at a at a given time or like it can switch back and forth quickly, where um, uh, it can also do instructions out of order. Yeah, it can do multiple instructions in one, where you can say. I want you to take this folder, uh, take this file, copy it, and move it here. And it just does it. Where ARM-based processors, you have to say, take this file, okay, now copy it. Okay, now move it here. So you have to do it individually, individual yeah. instruction sets, which just kind of slow down the process. But that's something for a, for a different time. Yeah. yeah. A little, little off topic. Yeah, we're starting to run long here. Let's hop into something that we all know pretty well and that is um memes yes <laughs> um, let's hop into like gaming everybody okay here, gaming. Here i'm go. a pro gamer Correct? i'm a pro you could you could yeah. you yeah, consider me a so. pro gamer all right <laughs> charles do you game on pc uh not very much okay uh what do you primarily use to game on uh, PlayStation. Okay. My boy. And PlayStation, is, PlayStation and Xbox, for those who don't know, uh, well, at least with, the, so the Xbox 360, the Xbox One, the PlayStation 4, for sure, they use AMD-based. Uh, yes. CPUs they're, and GPUs. Yep, they're, they're, I think they're APUs, custom-ordered, right? Yeah, they're custom. Um, yeah. Which... You know, that's something interesting is because uh, they're able to do them cheap and these um, console makers don't need to make hardware as powerful as they do on a computer because even a modestly priced computer can smack a console around in terms of pure computing power. The advantage yeah. that a console has is that it is optimized to only run games, basically. Yeah. Whereas a computer needs to be able to do, you know, everything it needs to be able to open up 30 chrome tabs and not die on us right it needs to be able to run <laughs> a whole wide range of yeah i mean it makes sense because the, the the consoles are running one game that one, while a computer will be running you know a game plus a whole bunch of other programs that are open on it right um yeah like normally when i game like i have discord open i have chrome open uh game yeah. itself steam i've opened like, up two i've opened up two games before I did it on an accident, and they were both Bethesda games, and it kind of froze my computer. <laughs> we watch, uh, Nick and I watch this one streamer, and this guy has, like... Well, at least 18 crabs open at a time. 18 Chrome tabs, and, like, 15 <laughs> different programs. And Nick, I think you said 18 crabs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> crabs. Chrome that's tabs, crabs. crabs. That's what I, that's what I, that's my, uh, that's how I shorten up the... Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Just say crabs. Crabs. Anyway, <laughs> so um, these console operating systems are much lighter than Windows, so that they have less. Uh, they don't have to have <laughs> as powerful software. It's crabs, Nick. That's crabs. Crabs. It, crabs. Yeah, I guess crabs. 
anyway, getting back to gaming performance, uh, I'm going to quickly go over how most games utilize the CPU, and then <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about how most games utilize the CPU, and then we'll discuss how... Apparently Cram is alcohol. AMD. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll discuss how AMD... How Thanks for the quick... How tip. AMD and Intel have compared in terms of uh, gaming performance, especially recently. So basically, how a game works is it has one core that it utilizes that it that um, is called the world core, and what that is in charge of doing is dishing out all of the workload to all the other cores. So like it goes, okay, I need to run a physics simulation. I'm going to tell this core to run that physics simulation. I'm going to tell this core to do this. And so it dishes out um, it dishes out uh, processors for each core to do, and then they report back with whatever, and then it you know tells the game. And the issue with that is is that when you have one core in charge of doing everything, basically, like dishing out everything and having everything run through one core, the more cores you have does not equate to having better performance. And it really determine it's really determined by how a game is optimized to use cores. So like maybe a game is optimized so that it can use multiple world cores talking to each other and also dishing out to different cores so that it can run more simulations quickly, stuff like that. Um, yeah, but... I think that's when you're getting into stuff like uh, DX12 and the Vulkan ar architecture, right? Where they're starting to use way more cores. I mean, you'll see, like my brother's computer that has the. Uh, Ryzen, I think it's the Ryzen 5 2600 or something like that. And um, with his on a DX12 game, you're seeing almost all of the cores being utilized pretty close to equally. But if it were to be a DX11 title, it would probably be using only a few cores. Right. And that's something that Vulkan, the Vulkan API, has done for a while. Is it's yes. always been known to be able to utilize more cores, though. So it's really about how a game utilizes cores. It's optimized. Right. Um, but most games, because of that, how far ahead Intel got there in that early two, in that 2012, 2013 range, that's when we saw games go, okay, we don't need to utilize a bunch of cores that AMD is offering. We can do that one world core just fine because the Intel processors had such a high instruction per clock ability, they weren't getting mm -hmm. that bottlenecking. And we're just now starting to see where, because more cores are becoming more popular, we're starting to see games utilize more cores. Indeed. So because Intel has that slight advantage in uh, instructions per cycle still over the Zen 2 architecture, you still get a slight advantage in frame rate and um, stuttering these Intel systems over the AMD systems. Now it's close. It's like very close. We're talking like within 10% of a difference. You know, you're getting you know 96 frames on the AMD system and 105 on the Intel system or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's like, um, uh, yeah, I was going to talk about how AMD CPUs, I think it's a 3950X. I think it has a turbo frequency of 4.7 gigahertz, yeah. while the Intel CPUs are around 5 gigahertz. So it's, it's again, really not that big of a difference between the two now. Right, and clock speed does not determine, does not necessarily determine a faster processor. Right, because uh, when I had my old CPU, it was clocked to a pretty similar frequency as the one that I have now is. But this one performs uh, much better than that last one, simply because it's a smaller architecture, and it's just kind of overall better for gaming. Right, because it has that better. It, gaming is all about single core instructions per cycle. If that, if yes. you have one wor weak world core that is dealt with dishing out all of the tasks for the other cores to deal with, um, you're you're gonna notice a m way worse experience. Exactly. Which is something that for a long time Intel had 
a huge lead on them because they had way more capable cores than AMD stars. But but the Ryzen has really closed that gap. They have. So now we're it's just... it's getting closer and closer. Yeah, and it's up to Intel to really respond to see where we're going to go from here. <laughs> they're just gonna they're just gonna come out one day and say, "All right, we've released our new uh, um, quantum computing line of processors." <laughs> yeah, well, so it like, well, draws okay. power from a black hole. Quantum computers, <laughs> quantum computers don't <laughs> they don't work. They wouldn't work. For yeah, normal but computers. they will. They can't. <laughs> <laughs> they can't work for normal computing. Just Matt, you have to look at this in a positive way and think about the fact that they could. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, that's, looking like, that's looking like about an hour, if you want to start wrapping it up. Yeah, so... Nick, you would... You like... You're you're good with the AMD stuff now, right? Like, you had an Intel yeah, system? Yeah, uh, um... I've had an Intel system. Uh, that's what my old computer used to be, because when my dad worked at Intel, they just let him keep home shit. So, uh, he made a computer. I mean, it worked, but it only worked for, like, older games and, like, less new ones, but that's just because it was old. But my Ryzen one is pretty good. I like it. It runs very well. That's what I want it to do, usually. Um, and the main reason I go with Ryzen is just because it's so mu- it's just a lot cheaper and it lets you do a lot for the price. Like I think, I mean, Intel may be stronger, but they're really expensive. And with Ryzen, I think you get the most bang for your buck. Yeah. Okay. That's a great argument. That's a great argument. Uh, Dan, what are you? Very cool. Dan, what is your view on things? If I were to build a new system, uh, right now, I'd probably go with AMD. Simply because they're cheaper, like Nick said, and they have more cores, which is something I think will uh, be of benefit uh, in the future because we're seeing a larger move to DX12 and Vulkan and things like that. Mm-hmm. And like we were talking about earlier, those APIs really like CPU cores and lots of them. So right, that's where I stand there. Okay. Uh, Stefan. What's up? You're given uh, whatever money you want to build a new system. You're building an AMD-based system or an Intel-based system. Um, I'd probably still go with Intel just because um, I've always used Intel, and I've seen Intel is very reliable. Um, I know that kind of sounds stupid because I've never tried AMD, but, I mean, I kind of just like, you know, why fix something that's not broke? You know, <laughs> Intel works well for me, and it always has, so I don't see a reason to switch. Um, the only reason I would is if there was, like, a significant price difference for the next Intel, like, processor I was going to buy. So, like, because I'm, I'm still, I, I, this i7 is going to last me at least another year or two right. before I really want to do anything with it. So, like, when it comes time, I might do AMD if it is the cheaper option and, you know, better processing power. But where I stand right now is Intel is still, in my opinion, better. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, One of the things that I didn't talk about uh, that I'd like to bring up real quick is the because the third gen Ryzen was so good for its price, we saw like the 9700K, for example, versus the Ryzen 3 3700X. They're pretty close. The Intel one is a little more powerful, but because of how popular the Ryzen got, I, like say if you were to buy your processor off of Amazon, the 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 ninety seven hundred K dropped dramatically in price, so that it is now slightly cheaper, if not the same price, depending on sales, as the thirty seven hundred X, and that's where I would go. So if I were to build like a like a ninety seven hundred K or a thirty seven hundred X based system, I would just go with personally the ninety seven hundred K because it's pretty much the same price and you do still get that better um, gaming performance even if it's only slightly at this point uh, also the fact that the 9700k has eight physical cores sadly no hyper threading but the eight physical cores is plenty to do pretty much every single game and then also do streaming or recording on top of that um, real quick, I was thinking too that uh, AMD, like when I was when I was reading the um, 
the articles you gave me, how their sales and everything, like their stocks boosted too. Yeah. I'm thinking too, since they are have they have more money, they're probably they might be able to put more um, time and effort into what they're building and make it even better. Yeah. But I mean, hopefully, still retaining their cheaper pricing. Yeah. Yeah. In in the past, Intel has dominated the market. I mean, like. Yeah, and then as soon as and, there was an opening from Intel's uh, CPU shortage, that's when it snuck. Yeah, that's why like Ryzen had a Ryzen or not Ryzen AMD had a hard you know time getting into the market with them because of you know, how good and how well-known Intel was. Not yeah. many people, you know, really thought AMD would be able to compete. And now yeah, people are actually I, realizing that it can. Yeah, because I was talking to my dad about it. He says when, you know, like, when back when uh, he worked in the computer business, and he was in there for a good 25, 30 years, he said every year C uh, AMD would came nowhere near close to Intel. He says no one ever thought they would get bigger than they were. And when I was trying to... I guess you could say explain to him that they're making pretty good CPUs now. He says, uh, he says he, it surprised the hell out of him. And yeah. he says, when so I was talking about their stocks too, he said their stocks haven't really gone up. But I think the last time I talked to him about this was like less than a, like half a year ago, maybe like four months ago. So I don't know how their stocks are doing now in terms of you know, looking at it from the stock market. Well, an article showing their uh, showing how well they're doing. Right. Um, one of our sources here. I'm it looks like stocks have been going pretty up. Yeah. Pretty much year up over year growth for Intel, or sorry, AMD since. Um, uh, year over year growth for AMD since the introduction of Ryzen has been consistently oh. better. Yeah. They've been. If you look at it. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> you go ahead. Um. But when you look at like like the just like the total market share, um, Intel still has like seventy five percent of the market. So like, as much as AMD is making growth here, they're still they still have a lot of ground to catch up on if they're yeah, going to overtake but Intel. What's good to look at is if you actually look at um AMD's like stock, they like in the beginning of twenty fifteen they had. Bear, or beginning of 2016, sorry, they had not like their sh their stock shares were 279 per share, and now they're up to around 50, 40 dollars per share, and so they've definitely just steadily been inclining. And then once uh, the Ryzen was introduced, I just it, it, it exploded. So I mean, yeah, and once people started realizing that they were actually good and they could compete with Intel, people started buying them more. But obviously, they're not up anywhere near Intel right now because you know Intel has been going at this from many many years right they've been dominant for so long right but i think the i think the conclusion we can all come to is amd ryzen is no joke this is a legitimate option now especially if you're looking in the high-end market and if you want to save money too exactly anything basically amd now with ryzen has a competitor at every single level of the cpu market which is something they have not been able to do for a long time. I also forgot to mention, I also have the very first gen of Ryzen, so like when it first came out, and it works pretty well on newer games that like might have came out like a year ago and stuff like that. Um, but I, when I get, I want to try and get a new Ryzen later on, and I want to see if, I want to see the, the difference in generations to I don't know what the word is to, I guess you say compare to see how much they, they changed it, tried to improve it. Mm -hmm. But for having the, like, the very first generation of it, I would say it's definitely worth it. You yeah. Make them like, uh, <clears throat> even if they make like the older generations cheaper, I would say go for them if you want to, because I mean, there's, they're, they're really good options. Like I can, I run Siege, which um it can be a heavy game depending on, play it but i can run siege within at least 140 fps just it, it handles it pretty well and i know that also has to do with their graphics card but i'm just talking in terms of CPU. It, it, it does its job yeah and being for being an older one because i i think my cpu is about four years old but that's because when i first bought it i didn't my computer wasn't working at the time and i didn't care enough to try and fix it yeah okay 
All right. Well, I think we've pretty much run out of uh, time here on our first uh, podcast. Hey, that's pretty good. Our first real podcast hour. Our first, first. real podcast <laughs> hour. There it is, boys. That is it. All right. So I'd just like to thank everybody for listening. Uh, again, if you want to check the sources that we have compiled, they're going to be uh, in the description. It'll be a link to a Google Doc that you can view. And um, I think that's going to do it. Uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Gracias. If there's one thing you should take away from this, just remember Daniel's an idiot.